So at this point, we have seen the theoretical properties and we have seen some examples um, of block ciphers and of stream ciphers. In particular, we have seen the block cipher AES. And we have also seen what um, security features we want to have. So for instance, for AES, um, we're assuming, or we, we want to use in, in bigger systems, that AES is a pseudo-random permutation. So that it's a permutation from n bits to n bits, which behaves as, well, a random permutation. Of course, it's not random because it's pseudo-random because it needs the key in there. So how do we know that AES is the PRP? In the end, we don't. So the best thing we can do is analyze it a lot, uh, but when we talk about approval security, then we assume it's a PRP, and then we can build bigger systems on top of it. For instance, you can make proofs about AES in a certain mode. So you can say, okay, AES used in counter mode um, gives you a stream PRF, or can we use as PRG, assuming that AES is a PRP. But for the latter part, we really need to look into the details. We really need to look into the um, building blocks of this function. Sometimes you can break it down further and say, okay, here's a core mathematical primitive um, that we want to analyze. But at some point, you can't do otherwise than really getting your hands dirty and, well, analyzing it. This is not different from public key cryptography. I mean, we have seen generic attacks so far in elliptic curves that work for any group. But you also need to look at whether there's anything specific for elliptic curves that makes it weaker. And of course, uh, to make the theoreticians happy, we also need to use families of block ciphers. We can't actually talk about the security notions for single block ciphers. Well, with these caveats, what I want to do in this lecture is actually give you an example of a block cipher, which is small enough to go through the details. So, well, also as a warning, when you're seeing proofs or when you're seeing statements, this, this is secure based on that, uh, you also have to be very careful and check the proofs. One famous example um, is OCB2, which is one of the modes. Um, so something which is assuming that the block cipher is a PRP and afterwards should give you a secure uh, so random net generator or a secure encryption system for long messages. And OCB2 was well proposed and proven in 2003, standardized sometime later, and actually, well, totally broken in 2018 19 Funny enough, in 2018 it started with some people noticing a flaw in the proof, like a small mistake there. And then with more work managed to break this open and other, pe other people jumped in and so now this is a totally broken system. Um, there are more OCBs, so don't say all OCBs are broken. OCB 1 and 3 are holding up fine for all we know, but hey, take a look. Also, all these statements can only be as good as the numbers you put in. So, for instance, if you have a perfect PRP on 4 bits, you might actually be very good. I mean, like with 4 bits, you can look at all the different functions. I mean, if you're looking at all the permutations on 4 bits, that's a doable number. And then you're picking them which have certain nice properties. But on the other hand, well, if all you have is an encryption system as a block cipher for 4 bits, and then you use it, say, in counter mode, well, you only have two to the four, so 16 different inputs. So after 16 blocks, this repeats. So this is, well, a perfect pseudorandom number generator, but for very small numbers only. So you cannot take more than four, uh, 16 times four bits out of this. And so you do want to have larger block sizes. Even, I mean, four is ridiculously small, and you wouldn't propose this, but if you look at um, actually proposed crypto systems, so DES, which used to be the standard until well, the early 2000s, so DES stands for Data Encryption Standard, and there's also a version of running it three times with different keys called triple DES, um, that block cipher used in, so a block of 64 bits. And that seems like, okay, 64 is, is pretty reasonable, you're not going to run this thing for 2 to 64, or if you do, well, you might think it's time to rekey anyway, but Bagarat and Laurent showed uh, in 2016 that you can actually use the small block size to break the use of triple DES in TLS. So that's a concrete application. So TLS is what we use when we con connect to the internet using HTTPS. And there is still an option which can use uh, triple DES, but they showed um, an attack using the small block size. Now, 
And you're looking at more modern ciphers, so AES, which is the one which was standardized in 2001, so that one uses a block size of 128. And more recent designs, so we have seen sponges and contacts of hash functions, and you have also seen like stream ciphers, so ChaCha20 is an example of stream cipher, and many of those work with internal states, which is similar to kind of what the block cipher weakness comes from, and these states are much, much larger. So ChaCha20 is using 512, and well, when you think of the, the Ketchak or SHA3 sponge, that was over a thousand. So much, much bigger ones. On the next two slides, I want to show you um, a block cipher, which is pretty fine. Uh, there are some small blemishes, but the only really problematic thing is that the piece, uh, block size is too small. The nice thing about it is that it's very short. I can show it to you on the slide. You can actually grasp what's going on there. Um, and you can also see, and that's going to be the part of the next lecture, how finicky this is, how small tweaks to a definition can lead to something which is totally broken. So let's jump right away. So the one I'm talking about is TEA, the Tiny Encryption Algorithm. So this goes back to 1994 to Wheeler and Needham, published at a conference, which is, well, for symmetric key cryptography. And it's a proposal where the block size is 64 and the key size is 128. Now, I'm showing you this in uh, C code, so I have to show, well, I mean, those of you who are fluent in this can just skip the next few minutes, and those who are rarely implementing in C code, or when you do, don't use, like, low-level bit operation functions, well, stay on, we're going to go through all these numbers. So we're starting with, okay, so the B, that's my input part, so I'm, my input to the function is a pointer to B and a pointer to the key. Well, okay, down here we actually see how large those are. So my block size is two parts, B, Z, B the first block and the second block, each of them being 32 bits. And so those two together are the 64 bit of a message. So an U in the stands for an unsigned integer. So you're having here 32 bits. And the way that you read this is in big ending notation. So this first part would be 31 goes to the 2 to 31, the B30 goes to 2 to 30, etc., all the way down to 2B1, B0. And then we're going to operate, do operations on these numbers, on these blocks of 32 bits. Well, the block size is 64, but we're doing this on blocks of 32. But, well, you see there's a lot happening. And we're going to use a mix of operations. Some of those are integer additions, and some of those are using the bitwise representation. Well, the computer stores it in a bitwise representation anyway, so that's easy to access. And so when we run through this, okay, here we have a for loop, which means we're running through uh, 32 rounds. Here is some integer. The prefix 0x means it's a hexadecimal integer, well, when you look at this as, a, as an integer integer, it expands to this, which doesn't probably mean anything to you, but it's 2 to the 32 divided by the golden ratio. When you need a random number in cryptography, um, you always have to be careful not to raise suspicion, so you're picking it in some way, which is called nothing of a sleeve number, so you're picking it in some way where you can say, hey, look, if there was anything wrong with the golden ratio, well, uh, that would be very, very strange. So instead of saying, okay, I pick the number 9, um, that looks suspiciously small, you're picking a number which is basically the same size as it could be, and then you're taking, well, some famous constants, a golden ratio, square root of 2, uh, pi, e, uh, famous numbers. Um, also here, this is a plus operation, so plus just means integer addition. Now, our integers are just 32 bits, so these are fixed length integers, which means if you're adding two of those, and you're reaching, well, something which is larger than 2 to the 31, or 2 to the 32 minus 1 to be precise, um, then it just falls off. So it's an integer addition modulo 2 to the 32. And then this is a shorthand in C, plus, uh, in C where you just say, okay, well, I take what this variable C and I add to it here, sorry. Then you're adding C plus equals D, that means C equals C plus D. Okay, two more weird instructions. So one is this carrot here. You see it here, 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 quite a few times. That means XOR, or if you're taking this as a, as a bit string, or as a F2 to the 32, so a, a vector space element, 
it just means each bit is computed, that is added, modulo 2. So there's no carries. So in, in circle diagrams, you often represent this with a circle and a plus in the middle. Um, you can think of it as a bitwise representation, each one or two, you can think of this as a vector. Um, so it is a thing which is very local and doesn't have carries. And when you um, look at those things, well, for normal computations, you know that multiplications um, have higher precedence than additions. And now we have a lower precedence, so this XOR operation has a lower precedence than the plus operation. So if you want to evaluate this whole thing, what you're doing is you're computing this one, you're computing this one, then you XOR these two, you XOR, or you also compute this one, you XOR them into here, and then you add the resulting 32-bit integer to x. So mathematically, this is a terrible operation because you're continuously, constantly changing your, your domain where you're working. Are you working with bits? Or are you working with integers more 32? But this is typically how we, how we do designs in symmetric key cryptography in order to, well, mess around with structure because what we're going to see in the, uh, in the next lecture is if you're doing anything clean, anything beautiful and mathematical, then it also gives a tool to the attacker. So having such a messy notation um, is typically and typically necessary. And the main thing you're doing here is we're using operations which are very fast on a computer. So computers, well, these are single instructions. It's just instructions of words. So this is a very efficient cipher and it's nice and short, so it fits on the side. Okay, last things we need to do is what do these less, less, or greater, greater means? And that's kind of an intuitive thing. So the, uh, this one, less, less, means um, that you're shifting by four um, bits. So if you're looking at, at this one, it's the left shift. And you're taking the input, so P31 till V0, and you're shifting it left by four positions. Okay, that means you're filling in four zeros at the bottom. And then, well, you only have space for 32, so the top four just fall off. So the B31, B30, B29, and B28 disappear. Okay, so that's a multiplication by 16 if you look at this as an integer. Multiplication by 16, more 2 to the 32. And then similarly, the, right, uh, the uh, greater, greater 5 means it's a right shift by 5. Now the closest you can think of this in an integer version is a division by 2 to the 5, but we don't worry about like leftovers. So it's taking the integer part of the division. So that means we are shifting to the right, the bottom 5 bits, whether they were all zeros or not, they disappear, and we're introducing 5 top bits which are zero. Of course you can do this with any numbers, but TEA is just using 4 positions left shift and 5 positions right shift. Okay, so now we've understood what each individual operation is doing. Um, depending on how fluent you are with C code, you might now actually kind of think of how it looks like. I've also written this as a circuit diagram. So um, this is just one round. There are 32 of those. So you're having X and Y come in and then stuff happens. So what happens first is that X is kind of stable. You see there's just passed through. Except for there is a, well, a box with a cross in the middle, the plus in the middle. That is a typical symbol for addition modulo 2 to the 32. So it's basically integer addition of 32-bit integers. So that's happening with the x. And now on the y part, well, y doesn't get modified, but y gets used as the input to three things. So one thing is it gets added to c. Next thing is it gets left shifted by 4 and then add it to the first part of the key. So that's a 32-bit part of the key. And then the last part is right shifted by 5, add it to K1. Okay, so now we have our three pieces coming from Y. Then the O plus I said before, that would be an XOR. So we have now reached the part where we have done this whole computation. And then, well, that gets added to X. And then what the picture nicely shows is that there's a swap. So we're done now with updating x. So x now goes on the side of where y was before, and y goes on the side where x was before, because now y gets updated. 
Okay, so then for all the, the steps for Y updates look essentially the same, except that I now take the X as input. Um, again, adding the C. Um, X get rotated, shifted to the left by 4. Not rotated, just shifted. Rotate would mean that the bits come back. Important difference, sorry. Um, and here we are using the other two parts of the key. Now when the round is done, then we're going back to the next round where X get motivated. So there's another swap down. Okay, uh, what I'm not showing in this diagram, by the way, is the update of C. So it's also each round update C. It's not always the same constant. We're adding this number, which is related to the golden ratio each time. So the C that comes in here is a C that depends on the round you're in. So if you want to build this, the circuit, then here you have the picture, and if you just want to run this on the computer, this is functioning C computer. All right, um, that's everything I wanted to say in this lecture to give you the example for TEA. In the next lecture, we're going to mess around with it a little bit more and see how we can, well, introduce weak versions to see a bit of analysis.